Good morning. I'm Mark Platchon. Welcome to a discussion group on transportation and mobility and what's happening in autonomous, connected, electric, and shared transportation. Uh, we have an amazing, exciting, super, super expert panel. Um, so I won't spend too much time introducing this. But it feels, uh, I mean, one, I think it's really appropriate to have a mobility panel at an energy conference. Um, mobility, of course, uses, I don't know, 30 odd percent of our energy. And as we're sitting here today, our friends in Washington are figuring out how many trillion dollars they want to spend fighting wars and keeping the Straits of Hormuz open so we can bring more oil in to run the cars that pretty soon won't need it. And uh, that's an important part of uh, changing the game. So the question is, um, who's got a calculator out? How many kilowatt hours of solar energy can you put in for the price of $100 million drone? <laughs> At 30 cents a watt, right, you can put in 300, 300 megawatts. You can basically put in a power plant equivalent with the price of one drone. So, um, and the drones are disposable. And solar plants last 50 years. So I'd love to see us sort of think about it that way. Um, of course, if you go fight a trillion, hmm? it's 20 million watts, 20 gigawatts. Okay. I think we should do more of those. Who wants to do that? A dollar utility scale. A dollar a watt utility scale. Yeah, exactly. It's five dollars, yeah. Long time ago. Cool. All right, we solved <laughs> that problem. Um, so um, this week's been a little crazy. Um, I've been at multiple um, mobility events kind of all over the place. So um, I got to tell you, I was actually, we were both at events, uh, some of the same places this week. Um, I was speaking at an event at Dearborn Inn, which is Ford in Detroit. And I had a hundred consultants to the auto industry and tier one suppliers to the auto industry. So I asked them my usual startup question, how many of you came here in an autonomous electric car? <laughs> of course, none. Um, how many of you own an electric car? Yeah, it's about 50% here. In that 100-person group in Detroit, there were zero. I These raised my hand. I raised my hand. I was you did, yes, <laughs> but you weren't a Detroiter. Zero percent of the advisors and consultants to the auto industry even had a present-day car, much less a future car. Um, and, uh, and then I did the same thing at the big event over in the East Bay on Wednesday, and they had about 75% electric people because it was self-selected. It's kind of interesting. Um, but then I went to an event, TechCrunch had a, uh, had a mobility event in the city, and they asked the question, who came in an autonomous electric car? And guess what? Breakthrough, there was one person who came in a cruise. <laughs> autonomous electric car. Now, the safety driver's still there. That's fine. It's going to take a little while to get the safety drivers out. But we're going to ask that question every few months, every year, and pretty soon, more and more of you will be coming in an autonomous electric car that drops you off and goes off and does something else. So we're at the beginning of huge change, and it's pretty darn exciting. Um, so we have a panel. Um, and, and the order we're going to go, uh, I think, is Sarah, who's the market development guru at um, EVgo, is going to talk a little more about the infrastructure problems and challenges and the, the charging network um, issues that, that they're dealing with. They're kind of the leaders 
in fast charging, high power charging. Um, Austin's going to talk about the, uh, the regulatory and policy side. He's the executive director of the, the UC Davis Energy, Environment, and Economy, or something like that. Um, he's the guru on all things policy. And, and I think that's super important here to get these things rolled out. And then Regina um, collects all the data from the cities on how mobility services are working and massages that data and sells it back to everybody who needs it to either regulate, manage, grow, or serve those new mobility services. So it's super important role in in developing the data that allows all this to sort of get there. Um, and we're going to do really short presentations. Um, they'll introduce what they do a little more and talk about those topics briefly. And then we're going to open it up at the microphone and have Q&A and discussion and try to get a little friction going and, and a little heat and get some action. And um, Sarah? I think you're up. You can sit there and do it, or if you want to get up and move around, that's fine. I'll get up. Cool. Oh, I had one other um, factoid I'll throw out there. Because um, those of us that are working on electrification and transportation, everybody always asks, um, how much energy do you need? And do we have enough energy in the grid and all those kind of questions? But um, there was... Sorry. <laughs> There was one, one question I didn't know the answer to, um, but we found it this week. A, a, um, the city of Shenzhen in China has pretty far electrified their whole transportation system. They have 16,000 electric buses. In Shenzhen, 36% of the entire electric load goes to transportation. 36%. More than a third of all the energy used, and that's a big manufacturing city, goes to transportation. So transportation that's electrified is is a opportunity and a challenge for the grid. Um, but first we electrify the transportation, then then you clean up the grid, and they're doing a good job of that. We need to get there. Sarah. All right. Hello. Uh, I am Sarah Offison. I This mic is a little tall for me. Uh, I lead public policy efforts at EVgo. Uh, we're the largest provider of fast charging uh, infrastructure for electric vehicles. And uh, this is actually my first time at Stanford. I live in Oakland, but my first time here. And I'm pleased so far because I got to drive in, charge my car across the street, and then I saw an electric shuttle. So not a bad start. Um, and just today, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview on charging infrastructure uh, and also talk about some trends that we're seeing in the space um, here in California, but with kind of a, a national outlook. And I guess, can I see a show of hands again? How many people, I don't, I don't want to just say own, but maybe also lease an electric car or drive one? Okay. And how many people have been in an electric ride share or car sharing vehicle, like an Uber, a Lyft, or a gig, or a... Okay, quite a lot. Um, so we have a very educated population here. And um, I'm guessing that many of you then, if you have an EV, you've, you've probably heard of EVgo. Um, as I mentioned, we're the largest provider of public fast charging uh, infrastructure and... Um, we're headquartered in LA. I'm based in Oakland, as I mentioned, and we're in about 34 states. Have about 1,100 chargers, 250 or so more going in the ground. So by the end of the summer, this will say about 1,350. And we're in 66 metropolitan markets. But while we're national, over half of our charging infrastructure is in California. And 75% of the um, electricity that we delivered, so the gigawatt hours that were charged on our network, happened in California. So California really has an, an outsized impact just because of the really great public policy that we have here that encourages people to drive electric cars. And um, 
how many people feel like they understand the difference between level one, level two, and level three charging? Because when I started, I did not. Okay. So again, we have a very um, educated group here. I think the way that I would just phrase this for the other um, two-thirds or so who, who aren't as familiar, which is very okay, is that um, as one of my coworkers says, it's uh, not different strokes for different fo folks, but different speeds for different needs, which I thought was very clever. Um, but essentially level one is I go to my in-law's house in Alameda and we're having a kid's birthday party and then I go to the extension cord in their garage and I plug in and then three hours later I come out with a whopping how many extra miles on my car do you think? Ten. Well, yeah, about 15, right? So that's not really a lot. It takes me about eight miles to get there, so um, not, not quite a lot. Um, but if you're somebody that has a garage at home, level one is perfect because you can do your commute and you can come home and you can plug in. So it's, um, it, it works in a lot of situations. Level two is what I used here across the street. So um, I get on my Bolt about 25 miles added to my battery an hour or so, just depending on the level of charge and if I have to split that with somebody else who's plugged in. But uh, I think longer dwell locations is, is how I like to think of this. So for example, as somebody who lives in an apartment, I'm very reliant on public charging. So now I only go to movie theaters um, where I can plug in my car, because otherwise, why go to that theater? You know, it's a waste. can't get my electricity. Uh, so if I go to see an Avengers movie, which is a three-hour movie, I get 75 miles, which is great. Um, but I think level two is better for places you're going to be maybe four to eight hours or so. A lot of, they're very common at workplaces, for example. Um, and I also like to plan my hikes around, uh, different state parks or what have you that have level two chargers. Uh, again, these are things that you do once you have an EV, you instead of, you know, scrolling your phone late at night, reading the New York times or what have you, you go on plug share and you plan out your life. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, Level three is DC fast charging. That's primarily what we do, though we do have about a thousand level two chargers as well. But fast charging is for short dwell times. So I was looking again, because this is what I like to do for fun, at um, all the chargers we have in this area. And it's a lot of grocery stores, a lot of retail centers, because basically you want to put a fast charger where you're going to be an hour or less. So, um, and, and I, um, as somebody who doesn't have access to charging at home, um, I use fast chargers primarily for my needs because that's my, my fueling source. Um, but we site a lot at, um, in addition to retail locations, also sometimes public parks. Um, we have a few sites that we've opened there and other places where somebody can grab a bite to eat or shop and then come back and their, their car has, has um, added additional mileage. So because we're at an energy conference, I also wanted to mention some of the grid benefits of electric vehicles. And um, as Mark was saying, he's he's been on the, the conference circuit. I have too a lot. I was in Roadmap this week, um, which is the one of the biggest EV conferences in the country in, in Portland. And we were talking a lot about rates and, and grid benefits of electric vehicles. Um, something that's really interesting is that rideshare and fleet drivers, which were about one third um, of the, the 75 million electric vehicle miles charged on our network uh, last year, uh, they, without price signals, are often charging during peak solar, which is really great when we think about how to manage the duck curve. And again, you can't really go to an energy conference in California without talking about the duck curve. But uh, we sent this, uh, when we put together this data, we sent it to the CAISO, and um, they're, they're very excited about this. But this is, again, without um, price signals today to those drivers. And how that happens is because rideshare drivers in particular are wanting to um, drive during um, rush hour because that's when a lot of people are out and, and hailing rides. They don't want to charge then, which is usually through the peaks. So they're charging often, and you can see it's not perfect toward the end of the day, but they're charging often during peak solar. I should also mention here that in addition to this, we did announce that our network went 100% renewable energy uh, at the beginning of this year for California, and then in May uh, for the rest of U.S. moving forward. The other thing, too, this is an ICCT study that came out, and we're commissioning our own study with UCLA on this topic as well. But we have uh, been focusing a lot on putting in fast chargers in high-density areas where you have a lot of residents of multi-unit dwellings 
through a legacy arrangement that uh, EVgo had with the CPUC. Um, we tried to do a lot of level two make readies at apartments and found uh, a lot of challenges with that, dealing with anything from condo associations to, um, for me, I, I can't ever charge at home because my parking is on an elevator shaft. So I call my car, it's very high tech in German, and then it moves around and you can see I can't really plug in cords to a wall there. Um, so there's a lot of reasons, not just dealing with electricity, why installing in multi-unit dwellings can be really challenging. So another complement to actual installations at multi-unit dwellings is these fast chargers where several drivers from the community can charge on that charger throughout the day in addition um, to whoever's commuting or, or driving through. And I think last, um, one thing that we talk about a lot in California and just generally across the, the country is there's a lot of discussions about equity. How can we make sure that we're not just enabling residents of um, detached or homes with garages, uh, single family homes to have electric vehicles? How can we make sure that if you uh, can't uh, lease or, or purchase an EV, maybe you can hail an electric car and get the exposure that way. So we have a really large focus on um, investing in low-income communities and, and disadvantaged communities. So 55% uh, of our sites under construction right now are in, in low-income communities, which often match well with that um, rideshare profile or also the multi-unit dwelling residents that we're often targeting for our, our charging. Here's just a couple of pictures. People get really excited when I tell them that we're at Chevron stations. Um, people, you know, because we're that's a transition in the um, the energy world. But um, other than that, happy to take questions once we get to the Q and A. Thanks. that up. Um, hopefully not too distracting. I have no, no slides today. I had uh, slides earlier this week in a talk and I'm trying to hold myself to one PowerPoint per week. So it's my new, my new PowerPoint diet. Um, nobody has ever come up to me and said, oh man, I wish you'd had more slides. So uh, it's also a bad habit of mine. I love graphs maybe more than I should. And so I'll just, I would, if I have them, I would be checking them up there. Um, I will happily talk through uh, some of the data I'm going to refer to uh, you know, during and after this, uh, if anybody has more questions or wants to go into it. Um, so uh, this is really just an amazing panel to get to be on. Um, several colleagues that, uh, that I've really valued working with. And then I actually just met Mark earlier this week in Detroit at a different event. We had never crossed paths before, and then now two in, two in a week. So the, uh, the transportation world is maybe smaller than, than any of us like to think. Um, I, I, I didn't ask for permission, but I'm going to tell the rest of the story of uh, his remarks where he asked uh, who there was driving electric vehicle and sort of looked at this audience of Detroit automakers and parts manufacturers and consultants and saw that none of them had it and said something I'm going to paraphrase uh, that just immediately won me over. He said, well, how are you guys going to build the future of transportation if you're not even participating in it? Uh, <laughs> unapologetic. So that, that's just great, right? And I mean, it, it is something that we should be asking, that, that, that why, why aren't we seeing more from, um, from, from the companies that, that have built our auto fleet so far? Um, but that, that's, you know, maybe neither here nor there. Um, I'm actually going to talk today about uh, the policy environment that these new technologies that we're talking about, automation, electric vehicles, mobility as a service, the policy environment that they're entering and what sort of keeps me up at night about where these technologies might go. Um, and then I'll end with a couple of uh, the techniques and policies that cities, especially in states as well, are thinking about to try to um, avoid some of the unintended consequences that the research community is now identifying. Um, so it, it's tough to envision these uh, consequences of technologies like automation because they're not really out there yet, right? So we're just seeing demonstrations. We're seeing a few business models that are starting to get onto the road with safety drivers for the most part. Um, we don't really see yet what this electric automated vehicle that, that Mark talked about really looks like. So we have to sort of do some creative thinking, some analysis and use that to try to tell us, well, what are these technologies actually going to look like in the future? And then what do we foresee as unintended consequences? And if those look problematic, what can we potentially do right now to help uh, head those unintended consequences off? And it's extra tough because 
in the research community, most of us really recognize the value of these things. So we're not saying, oh no, don't do it. We're not Luddites. It's not like, oh, don't deploy these vehicles. Don't deploy these technologies. The right question though is how do we both encourage them and foster a positive market for these technologies, but also steer them to provide the benefits and avoid the negative unintended consequences, um, of which there, there are quite a few. And I'll talk about um, I'm talking about an example of that. And then one other aspect of this that we're always thinking about the role of policy is to help enhance choice in transportation. So too often we think about policies restricting choice as saying, no, you, you can't do that or you'll pay, pay to do that. But the environment we exist in today, largely, um, is really a car monoculture. There's not really a choice outside of driving yourself every day in most of the United States. There's a few cities where you really have a robust set of, of transportation options, but most places, if you want to do anything other than own and drive your own personal vehicle, it's just prohibitively difficult and in many cases prohibitively expensive. So we want to be thinking about the role of policy as enhancing choices and then steering towards, um, steering towards benefits. Um, so we have a, a lot of research out there that shows this huge um, range of possible impacts. Uh, and you might think, well, we know that these vehicles are going to be electric, so they'll clearly reduce emissions. We don't, I don't think we know that yet. I think there's a lot of reasons to think that automated vehicles could be electric and plenty of reasons to think that they might not be electric, right? So automated, uh, electric vehicles take time to recharge, even if it's getting faster. And if, you're, if you own a fleet of automated vehicles and you're renting this out for people to take trips in, um, you're going to want to have that fleet of very, probably very expensive vehicles operating as, as rapidly as possible. Um, we also might see uh, a shift towards larger and larger vehicles. Some of the demonstration models out there for potential automated vehicles look more like mobile living rooms than anything else. Um, and those larger vehicles might prove uh, more challenging or more expensive to electrify than some of the sort of um, smaller vehicles that we sort of assumed might be the early uh, outcomes of these automated vehicles, right? But why would we actually go to that? The policy environment right now doesn't favor smaller vehicles really in, in, in any way. So why would we expect that, that, that uh, the automakers will build tiny little vehicles and try to get people into those when we know that um, many, and may, maybe most Americans, vastly prefer to ride around in a large, a large comfortable vehicle? Um, so we can't just assume that the thing that we want to happen from a energy, from an emissions, from an environment perspective uh, is the natural outcome. Um, so we see, uh, we've done you know, years and years now of research looking at what are all the possible impacts, what are all the possible energy implications of these automation technologies, and it depends completely on the business model and how these technologies evolve. Um, my colleague, so I was previously with the Department of Energy and the National Renewable Energy Lab, and we did analyses that have continued that show an enormous uh, range of possible impacts on energy use, so, so big that we don't even not know the impact, we don't even know the sign of the impact. We don't know, is this going to increase energy use or is this going to decrease energy use? But one of the, I could t talk about one or two sort of big picture fork points that really seem to influence where this goes from energy perspective. So probably the biggest one is, do people own a self-driving car themselves and keep it in their driveway so that it takes them to work every day or takes them to their destination every day um, and potentially you know, goes and parks somewhere or dri drives around circling waiting, for them, waiting to pick them up? Um, or do people subscribe to shared mobility as a service models where rather than own the vehicle themselves, they're just using a vehicle maybe in combination with microtransit and transit and other modes um, as sort of an integrated service. And in that case, you probably reduce your total travel demand, you might increase your mobility and access, but reduce your need to drive every day. Um, so that really looks like a big bifurcation point. And right now, we just I don't think we know which way that market is going to go. We see right now a lot of the vehicles are being talked about as being sold into big fleets, but automakers will um, certainly want to produce and sell the vehicle that people want to buy. And so if you have more and more people owning these vehicles, then they don't mind living further and further from work. I, I, uh, I woke up in Davis this morning, so I took a train and then a, a lift to get here. Uh, it's two and a half hours. I wouldn't want to do it every day, but if it was you know, in my comfortable mobile living room, then maybe, maybe I wouldn't mind doing that so much. And we already, as you know, in the Bay Area, see um, so-called super commuters who are, who are forced to do that and drive their own vehicle. So we know that this is a real possible outcome. Um, so we, when we're trying to figure out, okay, so which business model there is going to win out, um, we've started new research now looking at the 
costs because that's going to underpin a lot of these choices, right? People, by and large, make their decisions, uh, if not only based on um, cost, at least very largely based on cost. So as a bit of context, um, right now, if you want to own and operate your own vehicle, just the normal thing, you own a car, you drive a car, it costs something like 50 cents a mile. And that's including all of the things that you spend on your car. You bought it, you might have an auto loan, uh, you might lease it, you pay for fuel, you pay for maintenance, you pay for insurance, you pay to park, you pay for tolls, all of these things together, it, it depends a little bit on the on the vehicle, something like 50 cents a mile, just a reference point. If you instead uh, use a service like Lyft or Uber to get around, it averages something like $2.50 a mile. So about five times as expensive per mile. It's a lot more. And yet we've still, even with that price, seen uh, the so-called transportation network companies grow to really a, a substantial share, you know, approaching 1% of all trips, which may not sound like a lot, but that's getting to be about as many, about as same percentage as, as all bus rides in the United States. So we've seen with this, this much higher cost because of the convenience and the access and the preference for avoiding paying for expensive parking and all these other great things about those services, it's already become a super important mode. So what happens when you take that driver cost out? So we have some early analysis that really makes it look like the cost of that service, whether it's your own vehicle that you own um, or, uh, or a vehicle that you subscribe to, could drop down well under 50 cents a mile and could be a much cheaper form of travel, which sounds great. There's nothing wrong intrinsically with the idea of more travel. But more VMT in a policy environment that doesn't, uh, more vehicle miles traveled in a policy environment that doesn't capture the externalities like emissions and like the cost of traffic looks like a potential disaster. So if you just basically drop this technology, which reduces costs so dramatically into its existing policy environment, you expect some of these really challenging, unexpected, unintended consequences that we're, uh, that we're trying to look at. So cities are really thinking about this now. I think cities are, are really the most promising agent of change to try to take this stuff on. Um, we're seeing a bunch of policies. I'll, I'll mention six categories of policies really briefly, two of which we're hearing about from our, from our other speakers, and then four others that I'm happy to talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, so one is infrastructure. Uh, Robin Chase, uh, who founded Zipcar and is really active and a great uh, big big thinker on this, likes to say infrastructure is destiny, right? So we tend to um, adapt our transportation system to the infrastructure we built. So if cities go out and produce electric vehicle charging infrastructure, they fund it, they make sure it's sited well, then it can support an electric vehicle transition. Another sort of piece of, of infrastructure that's maybe even more fundamental is uh, just gathering, managing, and analyzing the data to understand how these new mobility modes are actually affecting the city right now and into the future. And we'll hear much more from Regina, who's a world expert on, on those topics. Um, we also see that cities are considering policies that would help preferentially enable the kinds of business models that improve their transportation system rather than causing challenges. So trying to incentivize pooling and shared use of mobility modes where you actually put more than one rider in a vehicle that wouldn't have been traveling together. So that can be done through preferential access to curbs where you say you're allowed to use this curb if you have this pooled model or via pricing mechanisms. So saying, well, we're going to set our fees for riding an Uber and a Lyft um, based on whether or not you're pooling and try to come up with a good way to price differentiate those, those modes. Um, cities are grappling with how transit, how the future of transit intersects with these modes. Right now, we don't know whether Uber and Lyft in the future are going to supplant and replace transit to, de to the detriment of equity and other benefits, whether it's going to enhance transit by letting people get to and from stations, or whether it's going to become transit. Other transit agencies will actually use these services to provide some of their some of their actual service. All three of those things are possibilities right now and happening to different extents in different markets. Um, and then lastly, cities are looking now at, well, if we've got a congested and a polluted center city region, like we do pretty much the whole Bay Area, like we do in New York City and Washington, D.C., and many of our other major cities, and, and increasingly even in cities like Sacramento, Maybe we have to say, if you're going to drive in a single occupant vehicle down to the arts, downtown, you have to pay for that privilege. Um, London does that right now. So does Singapore and some parts of Sweden. Um, so this obviously creates challenges around equity. You can't just say, hey, pay to get access and, uh, and just figure it out because that would um, impact the people who can least afford it. But there are ways to figure this out and say, well, maybe we can use that money we raise and reinvest in transit, reinvest in bicycling and pedestrian infrastructure to help make sure that everybody can um, get access to these center city regions. So cities are looking at lots of great and appealing policies. None of them are going to be easy. The ones that have the most potential appeal and benefit from a policy analysis perspective are always the ones that are going to be the hardest politically. Um, so we're going to have a really tough road, but it's really um, encouraging to see that so many cities are looking at these techniques technologies, recognizing the opportunity, um, and then also being clear-eyed about the potential for unintended consequences. Um, so thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion.
Hi, it's um, great to be here while these slides are getting set up here. Um, I used to be a transportation research scientist here at Stanford a couple years ago, so it's great to be back. Um, and now I'm the CEO and co-founder of Populous, and what we are building is a data platform to help cities and public agencies really steer progress towards um, these positive outcomes that we all want with mobility as a service. Um, so I'm going to focus my slides on really providing a framework for thinking about shared mobility as a service and how we're transitioning towards really a paradigm of transportation as an object that you own in the form of a car um, to transportation as a bundle of services that you that you purchase and may include a variety of options including cars, bikes, um, or trains. Um, so what we've really seen over the last um, almost 20 years now is a really rapid transition towards a variety of models that deliver mobility as a service. Um, from early models of car sharing such as Zipcar and City Car Share. Um, Uber and Lyft really transformed the space by delivering um, rides instead of offering you a car that you would borrow um, and typically had to pick up and drop off at the same point. Um, there are new models of car sharing that also were introduced that were free floating and a little bit more flexible where you could pick up a vehicle in one location and drop it off at another location in a city. Um, and then in 2017 and 2018 in particular, uh, we saw the rapid rise of micro mobility or shared um, bikes and scooters, primarily scooters that have kind of taken the world by storm. So out of curiosity, how many of you guys have ridden in a shared electric vehicle? What was that number again? A shared electric vehicle, so in an Uber or a Lyft. And how many of you have tried a shared scooter? <laughs> so almost the same number. So it's pretty fascinating. I think there are probably in many dense urban areas almost as many people who have used a small electric vehicle like a bike or a scooter um, as have ridden in a shared car that's electric. Um, so the adoption of new mobility services is rapidly accelerating. We produced a report called the Micromobility Revolution um, last July um, in the midst of the scooter craze. And what we were finding is that um, adoption of electric scooters was actually on a very steep trajectory um, uh, as fast, if not faster in growth than um, ride-hailing services before them. And there are a number of factors that have led to that growth. Um, one is that, believe it or not, smartphone adoption when Uber and Lyft were introduced was about 35% in the United States. And uh, GPS-enabled smartphone adoption um, is over 80% in most major metros where these services were introduced. Um, traffic in many major cities um, is getting worse. And it's actually faster to bike or scooter trips that are three miles or less, which is the sweet spot. Um, for small shared electric mobility. Um, and then finally, there have been large amounts of venture capital dollars that have been um, poured into accelerating the micromobility revolution. And so, um, you know, we're seeing scooters in over at least 180 cities in the world, um, and that's in basically one year. Um, so one key question um, in this mobility as a service paradigm is who owns the consumer? Um, and I'd like to suggest that there are kind of two key models that have emerged. Um, an older model um, that actually a company that I left uh, Stanford to join called Ride Scout, which became Movil um, through an acquisition by Daimler, um, was really focused on integrating different mobility services, shared cars, shared bikes, transit, all into one third-party app. So Google Maps it could be an example of this. Uh, there are apps like Transit and City Mapper that aggregate multiple options, um, but most of them don't actually deliver the services themselves. They really just present the information and maybe allow you to book and pay for those services through one app on your phone. Um, but what we've seen, I think, in particular over the last 18 months is more and more consolidation by mobility operators themselves who want to own that consumer. <laughs> and so they are becoming full stack providers, as I like to describe it. Um, you have Uber, which purchased a bike sharing company um, called Jump, um, and now is starting to integrate transit into their solution. You have Lyft, which also purchased a bike share company called Motivate, um, which is in most of the major US cities in the United States, including New York City Bike, um, what was called Ford Bike in San Francisco Bay Area, um, and others, and are trying to integrate and bundle those services themselves. Um, Bird, just in the last week, bought a company called Scoot, which offers mopeds, and then Lime introduced car sharing. Um, so these are kind of two key models. Um, I think that 
there was a third model, which was that cities would own that consumer. Um, I, my personal take is that a lot of the experiments that cities were developing um, to try to integrate and develop apps that they themselves um, delivered to their citizens, most of those didn't really pan out. They didn't see a lot of great adoption by users. Um, and so that is a third model. We haven't really seen it um, emerge as particularly successful yet. So Austin provided a um, great overview of the key issues around energy and how do the different lovers um, towards shared autonomous and electric mobility, how can they shape whether or not we see really positive energy and emissions outcomes or negative ones? And um, one of the things that I was really focused on as a researcher um, here at Stanford was understanding what are the behavioral impacts of these new mobility services. Um, so I produced a number of reports um, that took representative data in major metros where I asked people, for that last Uber or Lyft trip, what would you have done otherwise? Um, and so looking at some of the key stats, one thing that's very interesting is two years ago, I produced a report um, that showed that approximately 35% of people in the Bay Area um, were using services like Uber and Lyft. Now that number is um, probably well over 50%. This is based on data from the end of last year. Um, and that number is high in most major US metros. Of those individuals in the Bay Area, 21% um, have gotten rid of, decided not to purchase a car, or never had a car to begin with. So one of the key levers of shared mobility <clears throat> services is getting people to get rid of their own vehicles that they own. Um, and we're seeing that happen um, in, in, in many major metros, and the numbers are quite high here in the Bay Area. Um, however, another key behavioral impact is what people are making their trips in. So there's the issue of who owns the vehicle, um, but if there are as many miles on the road because you've given up a vehicle but you're making just as many trips in an Uber or a Lyft, you're still gonna see <laughs> lots of impact in terms of traffic, miles, um, energy use, and potentially emissions depending on what those vehicles are powered by. Um, so another key question is, what are people substituting these trips for and are they generating new trips? Um, and what my research previously had shown is that over 60% of trips nationally um, would have been made by biking, walking, public transit, or wouldn't have been made at all. So that's a pretty large number. And with that sort of behavioral change, we would likely see more vehicle miles on the road, more energy use, and um, potentially more emissions. So cities are incredibly important and the public sector um, as a whole. Um, in order to steer progress towards public goals. Um, you know, private sector companies, um, for which I network for one, um, aren't motivated by um, public goals. They're not measured by those public goals. Um, and so cities really need access to data and information in order to ensure that we are making progress towards energy goals, environmental goals, um, equity goals, um, and then also to ensure that we're seeing efficient forms of transportation by way of reducing traffic. Um, so cities now in the United States and around the world are starting to say to new mobility service providers that are arriving, you need to give me data. <laughs> Show me the data. Uh, and so they're starting to ask for real-time data from these mobility services. Today we're seeing that happen um, at a very rapid scale with dockless um, bikes and scooters um, so that they can monitor those fleets. Um, a very common policy in many major U.S. cities is to cap the number of vehicles. So if you're a scooter operator and you arrive in Chicago, Chicago might say, um, Bird, Lime, Uber, Lyft, you each get 250 scooters. That's pretty standard policy today. Um, but if you hit a certain utilization rate of, say, four rides per day, we'll let you increase your fleet next month. Um, they're also starting to make more data-driven um, policies, so the flexible vehicle cap by way of measuring utilization, um, and then also um, putting in place requirements around the equitable distribution of those vehicles. And a lot of this is really a sandbox for everything that's to come. Um, so that includes expanding to ride-hailing services, car-sharing services, autonomous vehicles, delivery robots, pogo sticks, um, whatever arrives on their streets in the future. <laughs> Um, so our platform ingests data securely and aggregates it and anonymizes it to deliver it to cities to make 
informed decisions. Um, one key example is identifying parking hotspots. Uh, so we work with Arlington County just outside of DC as well as 40 other cities to help them use this data um, to identify potential parking areas. In our platform, they can design, communicate, and monitor new parking infrastructure. Um, and again, this is for bikes and scooters, um, but we also um, are the only platform that does this for cars as well. So here you can see the city of Arlington um, has designed um, parking hotspots for scooters, and then they've communicated that to operators. And those operators, including Lime, Bird, and Spin, now tell their users, here's a designated parking spot. Please use it. Um, some cities are also using, um, in addition to carrots, they're using sticks. So they're fining um, operators if they have no parking areas. One example is Arlington is home to the Pentagon don't really want a lot of scooters in the Pentagon. Uh, and so there, there are also um, means to disincentivize um, people from using particular areas. Um, but really the key opportunity with data is that infrastructure is destiny. If we make space for more sustainable modes, including electric vehicles and smaller electric vehicles and bikes, um, then more people will use them. Um, we're seeing that happen in major cities now that they have access to bike and scooter data. They're actually carving out space, um, including parking. So here's a parking spot near a transit center on street. Um, they've removed one car from and put in place 15 bikes and scooters. Um, and so there are these designated areas that are popping up in cities um, around the world um, now that they know that there are lots of people who actually are really attracted to using these small micromobility devices and are making space for them to operate safely and efficiently and sustainably. Um, so I think that there are a lot of huge opportunities in the road ahead. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, a lot of cities are thinking about bikes and scooters as a sandbox to plan for the future. Um, here in Seattle, we are ingesting real-time data from car sharing fleets to help them manage efficient curbside management um, and price for that space. Um, and pricing is one of a number of policy levers that cities can use to make sure that we're steering this transformation um, towards our positive energy and climate goals. So, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you all. That was awesome. Um, anybody that has a question, there's a microphone right up here in the middle aisle. Um, if you want to instigate and provoke something in interesting discussion, please come on up. Okay. So I was wondering if any of you are involved in um, Assemblyman I know, uh, Phil Ting, finally uh, in, indirectionally got money to really study EV usage in the state and how to get the state prepared for, for that as we go forward. Um, are any of you involved in that effort and helping with the studies that are going to evolve out of that? I, I've been following uh, that bill and then the, the, the language in the budget a little bit. Um, it doesn't so the study I think you're talking about, it leaves it up to the Cal EPA or probably the Air Resources Board to decide how to conduct that study. So UC Davis works with them on a lot of different topics, and we're, we're, we'll, we'll certainly be discussing how to go about that. So for everyone else, so there was a bill um, that's gone through a couple of iterations led by Assemblyman Phil Ting of San Francisco looking at um, how to study transitions to a fully electric light duty fleet in California. So are there pathways to get to where every single vehicle sold in, a, in like a some of the bills had a 2040 time frame written into them, yes. um, which is pretty soon, uh, to get to all, all electric sales. Um, and that is now looking like it's with language in the budget will be turned into a study via the probably the Air Resources Board to figure out, well, what would that actually look like? So it's definitely something we're watching closely. That's, you know, studies for the future is my personal favorite topic and my, my absolute uh, top. So we're looking at it, but I don't think we know, it, uh, you know, it's not even signed by the governor yet, right? So it'll depend on... Right, he had to go about, about it in an indirect way because of uh, Fraser and the Transportation Committee. So um, anything you guys can do to help incentivize the state or help push legislation, because there are trying, there are people who are trying from that, that level down. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, I'm Angela Chong from Epri. I have a quick clarifying question for Regina and then one for Sarah. How do you differentiate between shared like e-bikes and rented rentals of e-bikes? Just a clarifying question, the difference. Um, so I think we tend to use the term shared for fleets that are permitted 
um, with shared bikes um, that operators like Bird and Lime are deploying. Um, they tend to be under a permit model um, where individuals use an app and they're distributed across the city. The city knows they're distributed across the city. Whereas I think the vast majority of rentals, so let's say a tourist oriented bike share rental, um, tends to be picked up and dropped off in the same location. Okay. Thank you. And Sarah, I was wondering, have you, um, approached, um, large, like, conglomerates like McDonald's or even public libraries? Every city has practically a library about installing the fast charging or even level two charging infrastructure at all of their locations. Um, and if, if so, what were some of the impediments? barriers? Sure. So we have MSAs or master service agreements with a lot of major retailers um, and restaurant chains, et cetera. And basically the way that we approach it is when we're going into a new market. Um, so we, we go to them and we say, hey, you worked with us in this state. Let's go here next because the rates make sense, the utility rates, which is something that I could talk about for another three hours. But if anyone wants to get wonky with me later, happy let's, to talk offline. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, how do we what, – what public funding is available? Um, how well um, is the utility staff to handle EVs? Things like that. So we do a lot of market selection, and we work with – um, a lot of those those companies and in, in mul across multiple geographies. So examples of that would be, you know, Whole Foods, Walmart. Um, I think we actually do have a site at a public library nearby here, but we're not really doing level two for our public installations at public properties. What we have found is that um, they frankly, just take a lot longer to get done. So we we partner with a lot of cities, maybe 25 or 26 cities or so in California. Um, we've worked directly with um, on um, whether it's a um, – we're actually, we're having a ribbon cutting on Saturday in, in Richmond at Civic Center there. That would be a really great example of a, a project that we got, got done there. Um, but – we um, work a lot with cities. Um, those projects happen. They uh, sometimes take longer just because of the number of stakeholders that you have to involve. But really, we work with private or public partners. Um, have you approached like chains like McDonald's? And what are some of the impediments of having a fast charger at every McDonald's? Yeah, so drive-through chargers. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think there are some. We, I mean, I don't. I mean, McDonald's. Uh, I don't. I don't think we have any chargers at at McDonald's. But um, I think we have chargers at other um, retail locations, um, for example. I think one of the impediments is, I wouldn't even phrase it that way, because I think the impediment is how do you get somebody interested in citing a charger there, right? And um, actually, a great study from UC Davis shows um, that uh, there is incremental revenue that's driven to the cash register when somebody has a charger. And again, take me, I live in an apartment. I'm one of those people. So I really only go to places now and spend my dollars in places that I can charge my car because I'm just trying to get any miles I can get because I can't charge at home. Right. So you really do change your behavior a lot. So a lot of, um, providers that we work with are, are very motivated by the, um, the driving, the, the argument of fast chargers drive. Uh, revenue to the cash register, right? Because if you're only there for an hour, you can turn over the parking spot very quickly um, with a fast charger. So that's that's definitely one of the benefits. Thank you. Hi, uh, this was a great panel. I'm Jane from Health Improvement Program, and I am the manager of environmental behavior change. My training's in behavioral science. And I'm really um, impressed with how we can help people just continue to make these changes. A uh, couple things. One is um, City of Palo Alto just recently um, created a whole program for multi-unit dwellings mm -hmm. and charging. And so you might connect with them. They just they're just about to release it. Um, in our uh, department, we teach classes on electric vehicles. We have a climate change class coming up, and I also do something called uh, active transportation counseling. So um, I'm wondering, too, Regina, um, when you mentioned all this use of Uber and Lyft, I'm, I'm so concerned that those are mostly gas cars a lot of times. So how do we um, incentivize people to not uh, use so many of those gas cars and try to get some of our EV owners to 
you know, volunteer their cars in those services? Uh, and also, um, how are you using behavioral science to help people change behavior? Yeah, um, that's a great question, and I bet Austin can weigh in on this as well. But there is a Skinner bill in um, California which is looking at how we incentivize um, more EV and more energy efficient modes into fleets. So that's Uber and Lyft. It's basically an Uber and Lyft efficiency bill. Um, and they can also count um, some of these newer services because they've acquired bike share and started scooter share. They can use those as credits towards um, um, improving the efficiency of their rides. Um, it's a complex bill, um, and the analysis, I think, will also be quite complex, but it is addressing that very issue of ensuring that we have as many trips as possible um, in the most carbon-efficient mode, uh, whether it's a bike or scooter or an EV. Um, so that's happening on the policy side, which is great, and I hope we see more of that elsewhere outside of California. Um, and then on the behavior side, you know, I think that people tend to gravitate towards what's convenient and easy to use. I think one of the really exciting things about the introduction of scooters is that people seem to like them and are starting to demand more bike lanes in their cities. Um, in, you know, Europe, I think most people cite, um, you know, Amsterdam as, as the bike capital of the world. And there was a revolution that occurred when, I think it was originally when cars were introduced, um, there were a lot of children who were dying on streets that were being hit by cars. And that was, there's a huge campaign um, to redesign their cities to prioritize pedestrians and biking. Uh, we n Most other countries didn't have um, that transformational moment. And for us in the U.S., it seems to be the introduction of scooters. So I'm really optimistic about that. And I'll just add to the the bill that Regina is referencing that was signed last year is SB 1014. And that bill requires um, the transportation networking companies to submit greenhouse gas reduction plans. And uh, there's a stakeholder process that, that's being run by the Air Resources Board to implement that. Um, we partner with Lyft, actually, in uh, Atlanta and Seattle. They have their, uh, and now Portland, too, they have uh, their green mode product, where essentially through their express drive program, they um, can lease vehicles to uh, EV uh, or to drivers that that want to drive EVs, and then they help them with the charging as part of that. And another um, really important partner that we have is Maven. So Maven is GM's car sharing uh, program, and what they do is they um, they lease vehicles to to any member of the gig economy, and you can drive for any app. So it doesn't have to just be a specific. You know, if you're renting from Lyft, you you have to you know, drive on Lyft. But um, if you're renting from Maven, you can drive for Instacart, Grubhub, any gig economy job. And uh, we work with them in a number of different cities across the country. And they're a commonly used platform for Uber and Lyft drivers. Beautiful. And I know um, uh, the Air Board has given a grant, Low Carbon Fuel Standards grant, that has helped us give EV classes for free with partnering with the city. So the Air Board's doing some good stuff. Thank Great. you so much. Thanks. Liang Ming, Pre-Core Institute of Energy, Stanford University. And uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, it's a great panel. So uh, the question is to Sarah, EVgo. Basically, I really like the graphic you show here, describe how the EV can help on the dark curve mm -hmm. and uh, when we produce uh, solar energy. And, uh, but this is the best scenario. Let everybody think about the worst case, which is we have 5 million electrical vehicles by 2030. Everybody charge when they back home or maybe in Stanford campus, because after 4 p.m., it's half price if you charge EV here, okay? Then 5 million EV charge in the late afternoon, okay? At level two, which is six kilowatt. Mm -hmm. Six kilowatt, five million, which is 30 gigawatt load. The peak load today for California is, 30, is 29 gigawatt. We just add extra burden on the capacity of the grid. Because if we think about another case with a ramping curve from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., California predict which is a 13 gigawatt ramping events happen in three hours, right? So my question is how the, you know, the charging network company can work with utility to design the incentive to the drivers to charge at the right time, right location. Oh, by the way, we only have a charge point here. I want to see more EV goals. <laughs> 
Well, and I think too, I, I will just say that um, different speeds for different needs. So <coughs> if there's a site here in Stanford that it makes sense for somebody to charge for an hour or less, you know, we would be happy to put a Navigo charger here. But I would say having a level two charger here, I think makes a lot of sense because I would have had to move my car already walk over there in my heels and come back. So I think there's, you know, different speeds for different needs, longer dwell times, good for level two. But um, I, in regards to your question, so the way that this is being discussed right now, there's a lot of discussion on vehicle, vehicle to grid integration. And uh, the discussion is very different for level two and, and DC fast. Um, so level two is, uh, there's a lot of rates that the utilities are designing, EV rates. Um, there's also a lot of discussion about managed charging, um, which maybe I can let Austin talk a little bit about from the level two side. But basically, if somebody's going to be plugged in for a really long time, or if people are going to get home um, and then plug in their cars, how do they make sure that not everybody's charging during peak? And that can be problematic. So there's a, a number of um, discussions on that happening at the CPC um, and, and many other places. There's this big omnibus um, transportation proceeding happening. Um, I think they just named it drive or something. I don't know. All the, all the names of these things sound alike. Um, but uh, it's they're coming out with a study on that in October, and there's going to be a big stakeholder process. For fast charging, I think a lot of it comes down to um, rate design as well. So TOU rates, we don't have them everywhere. Um, but also, I think what we try to do is balance consumer experience with um, grid benefits because we can't tell somebody if they want to plug in at six o'clock and they're commuting home and running on empty, like, oh, can you wait a few hours? Just just sit here and wait a few hours. You know, that's a fuel security issue and that will turn people off from EVs. So whatever price signals that, that we're discussing internally, we talk about how do we balance um, the, the consumer side of that as well. But I think it's very different for level two and DC fast. Um, and, and there's certainly a lot of attention here on the space in the space. I agree. I have a, maybe a, a quiz question. I think we'll drive this home, actually. So this is, uh, and it's based on, uh, as far as I know, unpublished data. So there's no reason anybody in this room would know the answer. And I certainly would have gotten this wrong when I first, if you'd asked me three weeks ago. So of the 24 hours in the day, what do you think is the most common time for people to start charging an electric vehicle? 5 p.m., 6 p.m., and other guesses, sensible guesses. So this includes home charging. This includes people charging when they get to work. Um, all level one and level two together, most common time. I still haven't heard the right answer. So 8 a.m. 8 a.m., so 8 a.m. when people get to work is another good guess. There's little peaks at all these times. Still not right. 8 p.m. So why 8 p.m.? This is getting closer. Because I think a lot of people come home at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So, so why else maybe 8 p.m.? Who else is in the pg and &E territory? Mm -hmm. So night, night does turn out to be mo most common, and 8 p.m. is getting close, but it's not quite right. So what changes at 8 p.m.? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so midnight is, is actually turns out to be the right answer, and that shocked me. So I would have guessed more like 6 p.m. when people get home or 8 p.m., because at 8 p.m., the rates drop for most people. So depending on what rate, what program you're on, your rates may drop at 7 or 8 p.m. It varies by utility and by rate structure. So you'd say, well, people would want to start charging at 8, but that's not what they do. They set their car to charge itself overnight and then plug it in, and the default setting is midnight. <laughs> That's a problem. It's not a problem right now when you have a couple hundred thousand vehicles. It's going to be a problem, right? So the right way to do it is to say, okay, if, if you just want to have a charge overnight, then the utility can tell me when it's actually the best to use that, and I'll get a discount for that. And these are the sorts of things that PUC is figuring out. So the good news is people are being price responsive. The bad news is they're doing it in a, in a very dumb way, and it's enabled by the poor state of our technology, and there's no good rate structures. So yeah, I think we can get there, um, but it's going to take better rate structures, better technology. None of these things are big leaps. It just have to get it right. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Janelle London with Cultura, a nonprofit working to phase out gasoline vehicles as quickly as possible. And I have a question about signage. Um, so for the people who already have an EV, they have an app and they can find where are the charging stations very easily. The people that, you know, 90% of people in, the, in California who don't have an EV, 
are making a decision and having a perception about whether there's enough charging to get an EV, and they're not seeing any signage. Uh, and I will say, even if you do own an EV and it's nighttime and you decide you're going to charge at the BART station and your app tells you kind of generally where there might be a charger, it's darn hard to find the thing. So I wonder, um, what is there anything in the works to mandate freeway exit signs? I mean, this is more, again, for perception because people who don't own EVs yet don't realize you mainly charge at home. But to give them that comfort level, that perception that charging is everywhere, is there any progress towards uh, highway exit signs or wayfinding signs in cities or even like a bright pink thing that sticks up above the charger when you're at that BART station at night trying to find the darn thing? Do you want to talk about states and I can talk about signage? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Well, I guess I can say from our perspective, something that we started to do at a lot of our stations is point out where they're going to be. So it'll say EVgo charger here, and then people can mm. drive around. The other thing, too, is that there are several states that through their Department of Transportation, you can submit an additional application to just like on those signs that say, I guess I'll pick your favorite uh, fast food McDonald's, right? Yeah. There's, um, there's a sign that says like diesel, gas, and then now they're putting EV signs. So I think we're definitely getting there. Something that I – there you go. Something that I um, – think that I, I always encourage people to do when um, they're thinking about getting an electric vehicle is um, plug share, which I know is an app too right. and, and different signage, but plug share is sort of like the Yelp for EV charging. And um, what I do again, this is because I, you know, I'm a geek on this stuff, but when I go travel places that have a lot lower EV penetration, like North Carolina, which is where I grew up, um, I just look on my phone on plug share at what chargers are around and you realize there are so many more than you ever thought, right? So I think that that comfort is there, but I think that's a good point. People aren't always looking at the apps, but DOTs are working on it. I don't think there's state mandates necessarily, but there's ways to apply depending on the state. I, I actually think we have further to go than that. And I think that we're actually, I think signs are actually, this is, so we're now in Austin's hunch territory. So this is, um, but I'll talk a little bit about, about why I think this. So I think that signs are actually the wrong way to go. Um, that there are highway ones. We've got standard signs now. That's great, except it's a lot harder to find that than a gas station, right? When you get off, you see the big gas station sign. And I don't think the right way to go is to put up huge signs that just... But, but I agree with you completely that it's a problem. If you, we looked at, uh, so some of our researchers in the Plug-in Hybrid and Electric Vehicle Center surveyed people between 2014 and 2017 an awareness of the presence of an, a charging station. Have you seen an electric vehicle charging station? Had not budged in those three years. While we nearly doubled the amount of infrastructure available. So there, this awareness is a huge problem. I think the, the, the key is in the app space. And while I love and appreciate um, plug share, it relies on crowdsourcing in a way that I don't think scales. So to me, the answer is let's just actually get the data out there in, in, in publicly available APIs, application programming interfaces, where any app can go and grab the data and recombine it however they want. So we're seeing some progress. So Google Maps finally added a, a reasonably high quality uh, database of EV charging stations that now pulls from EVgo and, and, and ChargePoint and some of the other major providers. But it doesn't yet tell you, is it in use? It doesn't tell you how much does it cost? It doesn't tell you. I think it does um, tell you if it's in use. OK, I, they know they were going to add that. So did they add it? I think so. Okay. So they're adding in more and more of the data that you'd want, but it doesn't yet let you, for example, make a reservation. So the way it should work in the future is I just tell Google Maps where I want to go, and it knows my state of charge, and it tells me where I can stop to charge that's close by to a Starbucks or a Pete's because it knows I like Pete's better. And then it makes a reservation for me at the time I'm going to get there. And none of this stuff is rocket science. Like apps do this in other, other areas all the time. And then it doesn't just have an address. It has an actual lat lawn that, that shows me exactly where the station is. All of this can happen if we get it so that the, the data is available and in a standard format. Um, this is like maybe the one thing if I could wave one wand, it would be let's get EV infrastructure in a standard format from all providers available so we don't have to rely on plug share, which is people going and saying, oh, I went and it was broken. And it, I love that people do that. And the EV community is wonderful because people are looking out for each other, but it doesn't scale because not everybody will do that. Um, yeah, I'm so gonna, that's, my, that's my rant. Yeah, I'm going to suggest that... that 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 problem, um, you know, needs to be solved, as you say. The awareness is terrible. But remember, the only company selling a car 
where they really wanted to sell it was Tesla. <laughs> yeah. Um, all the others begrudgingly had a Zev car and didn't want anybody to buy it. So they designed it to be ugly and then they hit it in the back and didn't train their salesmen. <laughs> now that the Jaguar is coming out, the Porsche is coming out, the Audi is coming out, and a lot of other 48 new battery electric models are coming out that the car companies do want to sell, they will finally start to train their sales forces. They will put signage in the dealerships. And the real issue is, as you're saying, you need awareness that this car is going to work for me. And that's a decision you make at the point of purchasing or leasing or, or deciding what to buy. And so a lot of that education burden I think will fortunately be carried by the guys who want to sell those things. And, and yeah, government should be involved and nonprofits should be involved, but the only way to really do it at scale is to have the auto companies just do it. Yeah. I, I think, think you're, will. yeah. Everything you guys are saying is right. I'm still concerned about the 90% that aren't even considering an EV mm -hmm. because they haven't seen those exit signs. And I don't care if they're written yeah. on paper plates for now, just stick them up there. <laughs> Somebody needs to do a study. Let's see if it changes the mentality of people who aren't even thinking yeah. about EVs. Well, you know, when there's an electric pickup truck, an F-150, Ford will make sure you know where the chargers are. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we're running out of time here, folks. Um, we've, keep, we've kept you 10 minutes longer. I wish we had more time for questions. Um, what, all right. Why don't we take one last question? And I'm happy to stick around, too, Real if people want to yeah, talk. Yeah, we can all yep. talk. Okay, thank you for this great panel. Uh, this is Xiao Xiao from uh, Global Energy Interconnection Development and Cooperation Organization, uh, short for GECO, um, a nonprofit uh, dedicated to promoting uh, power interconnection and clean energy developments. Uh, recently, I have been talking with uh, uh, the local utilities, and uh, for them, their common sense is that uh, the development of electric electric vehicle has put a huge pressure to the power infrastructure, especially the system operation. So uh, what they propose that in the future, instead of uh, having faster charging stations at all the houses and uh, 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 some random places, uh, what they propose is to have clustered uh, battery changing stations. So people driving their cars to the changing station to change for a new battery. Uh, so. Uh, for all the vehicles, they don't own a battery, actually. Uh, the batteries um, are owned by some companies or utilities, so they just go there to change, like uh, what they do now for the uh, ga uh, gasoline. So they go there and to refill it. Uh, what they propose is that by this way, the utility could uh, better manage the waveform uh, like instead of uh, having uh, more and more uh, severe dark curves, that's right. what they. This is a, a, you know, this um, suggesting battery swapping for vehicles yeah, yeah. is is a business model that's already burned a couple of billion dollars <laughs> um, <laughs> and and gone down in flames. Um, literal flames? Uh, no, nothing literal in this okay. case. <laughs> Uh, the money burning flames. The uh, so so um, the the challenge was getting um, a lot of car companies to to share the same kind of battery design, the same kind of batteries. Um, it's it's kind of a non-starter for consumer cars. Fleets, Maybe. Um, commercial fleets may go that way, um, but. Fast charging improvements have gone so well that battery swapping is sort of actually, faded away. I actually think weirdly we will see it with scooters first. Mm -hmm. There's That's a lot right. of conversation right. about this for go -go electric road. bikes and uh -huh. scooters because there are so yeah. many of you them can, and they're smaller batteries. Yeah. And I think we'll it. see that before yep. we'll see it for cars. Agree. There's also a big design issue now because we've the new designs for vehicles integrate the battery into the vehicle. It's, Part of structure. The it's it's part a of the feature. It gets stuff. you low center of gravity and it gives you very good space efficiency, but that makes it impossible to swap. So I, unless you really back out of that, and that's been a huge reason why you can now have 250 mile vehicles instead of 150 mile vehicles. Right. Um, it's even part of the crash protection part mm -hmm. of the car now.
Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.